discussing the 2020 presidential election recap and the COVID-19 surge. Followed by a look at local election results, as well as an extension of the credit, no credit option for this fall with a catch. And finally, we're committed to bringing you the news, views, and info to go on this episode of the Report Roundtable Discussion. I'm Andrea Carvajal. I'm Brie Eastlick. I'm Amanda Mendoza. And I'm Jorge Flores. As you can see, we're continuing to practice social distancing, and we're going to conduct our episodes via Zoom for the foreseeable future. Although we cannot be together in person, we invite you all to continue to be part of the discussion. Follow us on Twitter or on our Thailand TV, Instagram, Thailand TV, CSUF, to keep in touch with us and view our new content. For our first story, as we head towards three weeks since November 3rd, President Trump still refuses to concede the results of the election. After losing to President-elect Joe Biden in both the Electoral College and the popular vote. As Trump and many prominent Republicans continue to contest the results, particularly in the swing state of Pennsylvania and now Georgia. Others fear that questioning the core of our nation's democracy could have detrimental effects, especially concerning the COVID-19 pandemic and even national security. For more on this developing story, we turn to CNN reporter Jessica Dean. An urgent warning from President-elect Joe Biden calling the Trump administration's refusal to coordinate on the coronavirus pandemic not only dangerous, but deadly. More people may die if we don't coordinate. Biden says he's making the crisis a priority, but adds President Donald Trump's delaying of the transition makes it complicated to plan efforts like vaccine distribution. Getting the vaccine and a vaccination, though, are two different things. The sooner we have access to the administration's distribution plan, the sooner this transition would be smoothly moved forward. While the White House has said its pandemic plans are publicly available, health experts on the president-elect's coronavirus advisory board say that's not enough. We need to be in the room, or at least in the Zoom meetings, with Pfizer and Moderna, as well as local and public and state public health departments. We need to be in those discussions now so that there is a seamless transition. The president-elect trying to work around the Trump administration obstacles, expecting an unofficial national security briefing from experts today, even as the White House blocks him from the presidential daily brief. Biden playing down the situation, referring to Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. The good news here is my colleague is still on the Intelligence Committee, so she gets the intelligence briefings. I don't anymore. So uh, um, uh, that uh, that is, but there's a number of Republicans calling for that. I, uh, I am hopeful that the president will um, be mildly more enlightened uh, before we get to January 20th. As the president pushes lies about voter fraud to defend his loss, new accusations the top Republican ally, Senator Lindsey Graham, is trying to help him. Georgia's Secretary of State alleging Graham hinted that he should try to discard some legally cast ballots as he oversees a recount. Graham called the claim ridiculous, saying he just wanted to understand the ballot verification process. President-elect Biden saying Trump's refusal to accept defeat is incomprehensible. More embarrassing for the country than debilitating for my ability to get started. Now you guys, we talked about the results on our show a few weeks ago, but now we're gonna go in depth and about what's next. What's happening now and what we're gonna see that could affect the future. You know, Trump isn't giving up. Honestly, I don't see him moving on until January 20th. And even then, who knows? But like Joe Biden said in the video, he will be a month and a half behind on doing background checks for his workers and his COVID-19 plans if Trump doesn't move into the transitioning process. Now, but I wanna talk about Christopher Krebs though. He was the director of cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency of Homeland Security. Krebs, he was in the position for over two years. His agency came out with a statement that said the 2020 election was, quote, the most secure in American history. For Trump, he saw this and he fired him right away. Krebs was a professional and his team investigated and found no problems. You know, there have been no problems that have been found by any of the professionals. Trump doesn't care what his professionals are saying. He only cares about himself and his power. Now, we as a country are still very divided, though. We have been for a very long time. And, you know, 
It's time that we luck over our differences and fight for the one common goal of finishing this virus and becoming one. With Trump still fighting for recounts and lawsuits, we won't be able to reach this. You know, another thing is the Georgia runoffs. It looks like Georgia will decide the Senate with its two runoff elections. January 5th is election day, and when they will decide, you know, who's going to be in the Senate. We currently stand with 50 Republicans and 48 Democrats in the Senate. If we flip Democrat if we flip both of them to Democrat, then Kamala Harris will be the tie-breaking vote of the Senate. Georgia, you have until December 7th to register to vote. So it's incre incredibly important that you do. Now, you guys, what are you thinking and what have you found? You know, first of all, Brie, I would like to say something. When it comes to President Trump, I think of him right now as a bad loser. And the typical transitions that we have from different presidencies has nothing to do like today's. And... Joe Biden, he's already trying to make his team for this transition, also for COVID-19. He's already specializing himself, trying to work with the presidency, but that's not the case. What I see here is that President Trump should change his attitude because he already lost the election. Biden won, and that's fine. That's democracy. We need a democracy, and this is democracy. And I don't see this when it comes to Donald Trump. If we go back to 2016, we saw how Barack Obama, former president, he was welcoming him with the best of the attitude. And I don't see this anymore with President Trump. So what I would recommend to President Trump is to lower his tone, to become more mature, to accept the results, and to continue forward because there is no evidence that there was such a fraud. So what do you think, Amanda? Well, personally, Jorge, I think this is very immature of President Trump. He's continuously writing on Twitter that Biden winning was due to election fraud and that he won't be conceding. However, Biden won 306 to 232, past the amount needed to win. So I don't see what kind of confirmation he needs to be able to understand that Biden win and that no matter how many elect, no matter how many lawsuits try and create, the results are the results in this case. What I'm curious to see is what's going to happen during Inauguration Day. How will he react? And will he be willing to say that Biden won? What do you think, Andrea? Just going off of what Jorge said, I mean, 50% of Republicans are claiming that Biden won because of voter fraud. And like you said, this is a democracy. And Trump and the Republicans are kind of diminishing this democracy and saying, hey, no, um, we actually won the American people are wrong, the counts are wrong. No, just accept that, you know, don't even make a concession speech, but one, t one term presidents like Jimmy Carter did and he accepted it. You have to be professional and understand that this is the way democracy works and this is how America continues to run. And as we move on to our next story, the COVID-19 pandemic is showing no signs of slowing down anytime soon. In the United States alone, 11 million people have now tested positive for the virus, and the death toll reaches nearly 250,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. According to CNN, in some hospitals, staff is so limited that doctors and nurses who are infected but asymptomatic are still allowed to work in COVID-19 units. In response to the COVID surge, Dr. Anthony Fauci asserts that local shutdowns are more likely than a national shutdown if numbers of hospitalizations keep going up. In California, Governor Newsom recently issued new tier rollbacks across the state in hopes of bringing down COVID-19 numbers. He has brought 41 counties that had made it to the orange and red levels back down to purple, including Orange County, which is the most restrictive tier. Reportedly, Governor Newsom and other officials are even considering a statewide curfew. For now, it looks like we are back to how we started in this pandemic. Now, I think we all kind of knew uh, shutdown or lockdown was inevitable at this point. It feels like every week or day we see new numbers continuing to rise. And there's this thing called COVID-19 fatigue where people are getting tired of the CDC guidelines and don't wanna follow these rules anymore. And we especially see this with the youth. We see this with celebrities, TikTokers, going to these parties as we discussed at the last episode, Kim Kardashian through, or Kendall Jenner through the party. Even Governor Newsom has attended a birthday party dinner and that's getting a lot of heat saying, well, if these officials can go, why do they get the privilege and 
we don't, you know, and Orange County is back in this purple tier, but LA County has been there already. And Governor Newsom said on November 20th, they wanna put in this 10 p.m. curfew. And now you're only allowed to eat outside. You can no longer eat inside. And it's understandable. And I feel like we will not get to normalcy until we do this lockdown. So what are your guys' thoughts and feelings toward this? Are you agreeing, disagreeing, Jorge? Powerful people, they, they are doing what they want because they've got the money and the resources. Us youth, um, students, families, we now we're thinking that it's okay because they do it. And I've seen so many cases with friends that they are doing it, that they're just going outside because they got this fatigue from COVID-19. If you ask me, yes, I've experienced it. And I think that's normal because it's been more than six months and we're just waiting to get out of our places and hang out with the people we love. The thing is that we gotta be stronger than that and that we gotta stay in our homes and stay safe following the CDC guidelines. So I consider this as a priority because we knew that the cases are gonna go up during these times. And now we got like several holidays that they are coming through. So we gotta be very mature when it comes to our mental health and for the families. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's really upsetting that, you know, we aren't seeing any kind of end of the light for the tunnel. And, you know, everyone is completely over it, but just because you're over it, it does not mean that it's ended. You know, as you guys were saying, people are going to these parties, they're going out, you know, and they don't really care. You know, Joe Biden has talked of a national, a nationwide shutdown, but truly, I don't know how much that will do, you know, if states are actually going to follow through with it. You know, if a business doesn't shut down and it's not enforced by local officials, then nothing's going to happen. They'll continue to stay open. You know, I truly don't see this ending until we get a vaccine. You know, Pfizer and Moderna, they both have vaccines and they state that they're 95% effective. And that's great. I think that's something that we can really look forward to. But vaccines usually take years and years to perfect. They did this in less than a year. You know, it makes me very cautious because, you know, they were able to do it so quickly. You know, until we get these vaccines and uh, until they have a date of when they're going to be released, we can't rely on it. And also in regards to the four to six week lockdown, I think some people may be protesting because they're sick of what's going on. They don't want things to shut down after they've gone so comfortable. So Jorge, why don't you bring us into some more local news? Thank you, Amanda. Going back to political news, the results are piling in statewide for California's proposition and election results. Here are some of the propositions that passed out of the 12 that they were voted on. California has voted to approve Prop 14, which will fund stem cell research, as well as Prop 17, which will grant voting rights to previously incarcerated people, and Prop 24, which will expand California's data privacy law. A few props that didn't pass include Prop 16, which will have ended California's ban on affirmative action, as well as Prop 18, which will have allowed voting rights for certain 17-year-olds in the state. In local news, California's 39th district, congressional district, which overlaps portion of Orange, Los Angeles, and San Bernardino counties, elect a Republican Young Kim into the House of Representatives, making her one of the three first Korean American women to serve in Congress elected this year. Now, guys, these are really interesting news here in our counties. And I want to talk about two of them. The first situation is about the Prop 18, that which have it allowed for certain 17-year-olds uh, to vote. I think it was such a necessary prop to be passed because we know that us, the youth, these generations are the ones that we're gonna be occupying the state for the next five, 10 years. Some people, they consider that us, the youth, we don't have complete knowledge of what's going on in the political spectrum. However, I think we do. And I think we got a lot of information on social media that we know what's fake news, what's not. So we should deserve this right for some 17 year olds to start voting. The second situation that I wanna know your opinion is about Young Kim. I'm very glad that we got more diversity in Congress, that we got more diversity when it comes to representing that communities that you are living for. In this case, Young Kim, she's a Republican and she was born in South Korea. She immigrated to the States. Now she's elected to serve for public office. So I want to know your opinions, guys, about diversity, about us, the youth, and more in this local news in our political spectrum. Absolutely. I totally, I love what you had to say. And I 
think that it's great that she was elected. You know, LA is such a diverse area. I'm not from this district. I'm not from this area. But I think that, you know, with LA being so diverse, I think it's so needed for her to have been elected. So I love that she was. You know, another thing I want to go back on is the Prop 18, like you were talking about. You know, this was the prop that would allow 17-year-olds to vote in primaries if they were 18 by the general election. And I think that if you're able to vote for the general election, you know, the primaries are only, what, like a few months before hand, why, why could they not vote for that one? And I'm very, very shocked and upset that people didn't think that this was, you know, this should be allowed. You know, they should be able to be a part of the whole process, not just the biggest part of it. You know, I'm very happy with voter turnout though. Voting is your voice and your voice truly does matter. So I'm so glad that more people are realizing that. You know, I know a lot of people who are were in their 40s and 50s who voted for the first time ever in this election. Even though they've never done it before, this election was huge and they, they knew that they needed their opinion and their voice to be a part of that. And I think that's amazing. And I hope that these numbers will continue to go up throughout elections in the future. And I truly think that they will. I'm just as shocked as you guys are on Prop 18. I really thought it was going to pass as well. I see nothing wrong with letting 17 year olds that are going to be 18 by the time of election to vote. But Prop 17, which allowed voting rights to previously incarcerated people, I was very happy to say the least that it passed because these are people too. They are citizens, they have a right to vote, and I'm happy that they got these rights back. As well as young Kim, I love that we have a woman and who's also a person of color, and we love that, you know, but um, it is shocking to see as a democratic state in general that a Republican did win, specifically in a district that I'm also a part of. What are your thoughts, Amanda? Well, in regards to Prop 18, I personally voted yes because I think 17 year olds have the ability to make informed voting decisions, especially since they have access to plenty of information on the internet. And adding on to what Bree said, I do think it's quite amazing how high the voter, voter turnout was this year in California. In fact, election turnout was at 79.2% in the state of California, which is almost as high as 79.42% during the 2008 election, according to the Secretary of State Alex Padilla's website. Well, moving on to our next story, as the semester comes to an end, the credit, no credit option after viewing final grades will be a no-go for this fall semester. As you may remember, last semester, CSUF offered a credit, no credit option for students after we transitioned to online learning, which is extended to, to after final grades were put in. However, in a recent email to the Daily Titan, Provost Carolyn Thomas said that this will not be an option for students this semester. Her reasoning was that students' new classes would be virtual prior to beginning this semester. Thomas said, quote, extending the credit, no credit option to this fall could have negative consequences for some students as it can impact financial aid, veterans benefits, athletics eligibility, and students who might want to go on for graduate study, end quote. However, some classes will be allowing for the option of credit, no credit for students, but only up until December 11th. In response to this announcement, many students are reportedly unhappy with the decision since online learning has not been a smooth transition for everyone. Personally, I prefer to see my grades and not to use the credit option because I feel like I've worked very hard this semester and I feel like it'll be a good pay off personally to see what I earned after I worked for so many hours. However, I understand that people are under different circumstances. Some people may have been very negatively affected by the pandemic. And so they may not be in the same place where I am. So what do you think, Bree? You know, I'm stuck on this because although I think it was great of our school to do this, you know, this last semester, like Thomas said, we all have experience with online, you know, last semester we had to do it, this semester we started with it, you know, we've had the experience, we know what we're doing now, but on the other hand, though, people are really struggling with online, it is difficult, and we didn't sign up for this, so I understand why they didn't continue with the credit, no credit, but I know that a lot of people are very upset with them for doing this, and I think it's putting a lot more stress on some students, so I'm kind of stuck. I personally, if it's for you, then by all means do it, credit, no credit. And if that makes, eases your mind a little bit at the end of semester saying, okay, I'm just not gonna get credit for a class that I'm not gonna pass for, by all means, if that's for you. But 
they're not all classes are offering this. So make sure you check to see if your class even qualifies for this specific credit, no credit thing. And make sure if you receive financial aid that you're still qualified for these things. So just be careful when you opt in for specific things that the school is offering. Jorge, what are your thoughts? Totally. I mean, I totally agree with you guys because that's the most important thing when it comes to your mental health. And I agree, some people, they just got the worst of the times during this pandemic. So I totally understand and I am in favor and I defend those people because that's a real thing. And with that, that's all we got for today on the Report Roundtable discussion. Have a safe week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Brie Eastlick. I'm Amanda Mendoza. And I'm Andrea Carvajal. As always, stay fresh, Fullerton. Mm -hmm.